I don't see a lot. So, I'm here to issue a challenge, an invitation to respond to an urgent crisis that impacts us all. It's going to be powerful, don't worry. Um, I'm a mathematician, and one of my passions is cryptography, the science of secrets, of making and breaking codes. If you look up the skills to be a cryptographer, you'll see things like degree in mathematics and computer science, expertise in data analysis, technology. But when you talk to a cryptographer, you're going to hear something very different. Cryptography is an incredibly creative endeavor. It's about being obsessed with puzzles, no matter how strange, and a willingness to indulge in wild speculation and intuitive guesses and imaginative strategies. And the joy in figuring out which of these weird ideas actually breaks the code. Mathematics and technology are just the tools we use to be clever and lazy in this process. To be a good cryptographer, you have to look for inspiration everywhere. You learn lots of strange, random things. Accidental conversations spark ideas. Insights from one individual or field can trigger an idea in another. And these conversations will take you in a whole new direction. And then you go for a walk, and you muse and reflect. And you figure out ways to use all this knowledge in completely unexpected ways. You find patterns and adjacencies, and you connect things that usually aren't. And then, when you're done, you move on to the next puzzle you've become obsessed with, and the next one after that. Cryptography is just a lens through which to see the world as a magical, addictive, unending source of puzzles. Too often, we treat problem solving as though it's about individual genius or about experts coming up with clear, brilliant solutions. But solving complex problems is actually quite messy. It's full of crazy collaborative experiments, irrelevant tangents, strange notations, dead ends. A clean solution usually starts with a mess. We have to create more opportunities for this, sort of primordial soup, so to speak, for these insights and breakthroughs to emerge. Gatherings of people with a diversity of interests and experience but shared purpose and urgency. Here's an example, Bletchley Park in England. It was 1938, and on the continent, fascism was spreading at gunpoint. Freedom, democratic values, lives were at stake. Note, I'm gonna let slide the fact that the good side was at the same time occupying India and denying us those very rights. Anyway, from, <laughs> from 1938 until the end of World War II, the British government convened a secret team of code breakers at Bletchley Park. They were charged with deciphering the sophisticated military codes of the Germans and their allies. This story usually focuses on Alan Turing, a brilliant mathematician whose ideas were profoundly transformative in the fields of computer science and information theory. Many of his ideas evolved from his work while at Bletchley Park. But I want to look at who else was there. There were the usual suspects, of course, the experts, mathematicians, academics, but this was wartime, and they were desperate. So they let go of their prejudices and included anybody with the relevant skills. And what were those skills? Well, to break codes, you need people who are good at solving puzzles, cryptic crosswords, for example. They actually had a contest and let in all the winners into Birchley Park. People who are good at creating and recognizing patterns, so artists and musicians, at deciphering symbols, archaeologists. 
People are good with words, poets, and librarians, and with strategy, chess players. People who are multilingual, linguists and classicists, yes, but also children of immigrants, often too poor to have access to a college education. And debutantes. Wealthy, marriageable young women, fluent in languages, but usually not encouraged to study things like mathematics. Apparently, abstract thought and reasoning were not considered highly desirable characteristics. The group included students and people who had never been to college, many who would not be allowed to work as code breakers or technologists if not for this war. Eventually, there were almost 10,000 people there, two-thirds of them women. The British were inclusive not because they were good people, After the war, they jailed and tortured Turing for homosexuality resulting in his death, and universities went back to primarily hiring men in mathematics, but because they were desperate. They needed everybody's skills because the known experts just weren't enough. Bletchley Park shows us the powerful impact of inclusive collaboration one that served an urgent societal need and inspired and accelerated just incredible technological breakthroughs. But there's something else, the process. They broke everybody up into small groups and gave them codes to break. When they were done, they gave them more codes and more as they came in. It was a process of intense, rapid-fire problem-solving. It was active and collaborative and cross-disciplinary. Do things again and again, and we start to find patterns, abstractions that lead to shortcuts, the clever part. We create algorithms and build technology to do the work quickly, the lazy part. And that's how we got to the computer, a technology purpose-built to serve a clear need. By the way, nobody told these people to invent a computer, but they did before they later had to burn it all down. The ideas and technology that emerged from Bletchley Park led to the rapid development of digital networks and computers. After the war, we've returned to our hierarchical structures. Today, we choose people to solve problems based on their degrees, their credentials, their employment history, their expertise. Convenings are not collaborations, but information dissemination. A chance to show off our latest discovery or our brilliant solution. The status quo has reasserted itself. It's the most bizarre picture. Um, <laughs> so here we are, 75 years later, in the world created by the brilliant ideas that emerged from Bletchley Park, where most of our communication, our interactions, are through digital networks. Now, in 2019, we're in another war, a war of disinformation created by what experts have done with this technology. We live in a time of just radical technological transformation. We're overwhelmed with information, smart devices, social networks, a time of constant surveillance and continuous real-time data gathering and processing. An atmosphere of dynamically responsive environments that constantly try to sell us products, services, politics, and manipulate our behavior and beliefs. The same technology that connects us, confuses us, and causes us to ignore and create our own independent realities. Our truths are drowning in seas of disinformation. This inability to see what's real has tremendous consequences on our elections, our policy, and on our safety. It keeps us paralyzed from urgent, essential action, and it makes it impossible to make meaningful decisions and choices. It's now a matter of life and death, 
whether it's lynch mobs and brigade attacks fomented on WhatsApp and Twitter, or massacres incited on Facebook, disinformation kills. So here we are. Our systems are stressed past failure, and we live in this atmosphere of fear and mistrust. The self-appointed gatekeepers of our platforms for communication have completely lost control. Our world is hurtling towards a technological dystopia where truth is encoded and hidden. And every screen is a window on the First World War of the disinformation age. Bletchley Park was the front line in a life or death struggle for the future of human society. Our front line is in your pocket right now. We have one year. We must figure this out before the next round of public debate and elections, before this crisis totally destroys our ability to engage. There are a lot of experts working on this problem, large tech and social media giants, huge um, governments. Here's the issue. They created the problem. Why have we decided that technologists are the only people who can solve the problems related to technology? This is a complex problem. It needs more than expertise. Because maybe the solution isn't more technology. Maybe we need something more imaginative to win this war. And then I notice we have this wonderful convening here, this amazing talent and expertise in the audience, both in the room and online. We have this at every TED event. What if we all focused on this one issue for a year and channeled our collective energy to solve one of the complex, urgent challenges of our time? The viral spread of disinformation and the dangerous consequences. We're on the front lines of this war. It's up to us now. The experts need our help to figure this out. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a human-powered, insight-driven, ble inclusive Bletchley Park aimed at disinformation. We're going to be the primordial soup from which the solutions emerge. So here's what we do, we'll do. We're going to start by hosting a gathering break this huge effort down into small pieces, create strategy, a strategy to move forward. We'll make it as easy as possible to participate and allow you to go as deep as you want. It's easy to start. Send an email to bletchley at tedxportland.com now. And we'll go from there. Join us. We need all your help. Maybe you, you have clever ideas or crazy ideas, strange, useful skills, maybe you just like to play with puzzles. Or maybe you just have rage at all this big tech that's gone berserk. But invite others. We'll help you create your groups and gatherings. You're going to solve small problems, share the results. We'll give you more pieces. We're going to solve this huge threat, one small puzzle at a time. And together, we're going to redefine what social engagement looks like, civic engagement looks like in the 21st century. And perhaps somebody will be up on a stage at a future TED event talking about their brilliant solution or invention that resulted. And maybe an idea that will bubble up that will transform the world. And imagine, we might actually have an election that isn't hacked or corrupted. And together, we'll create a new vision and model for TED as a gathering to mobilize a community with the ideas and the passion to solve the urgent grand challenges of our time. And in the accidental interactions that result, we're going to learn amazing and unexpected things from each other. Let's solve this problem of disinformation together. Our clock starts now. Thank you for listening.